Sometimes I wonder why people ask economists to solve questions, and people often think we come at the issues a bit narrowly. But I think that economists are not so much narrow, but they look at things rationally. And there's one thing that economists really understand. It's the first thing you learn when you start studying economics. It's about choice. And the point about this commission is that we are putting forward, and of course this is why it's difficult for um, particularly politicians to respond to, you're putting forward some really rather hard choices, which generally they don't, um, they don't like. But the motivation for all of us is a desire to see a system of health and social care which works better for patients. And I think the reason we want to do this comes across from the stories we have in the report and also those we heard firsthand from our group of experts by experience. I should say it's really nice to see a number of the experts by experience group here today. Thank you very much for coming along and thank you for all you've contributed. And it makes it clear that what we have today for social care is not good enough now and it's certainly not going to meet future expectations. It's our contention that while integration and NHS productivity are important issues, there are bigger questions that also need to be answered. I know everybody in this audience is going to be well aware of the contrast between healthcare, which is free at the point of use with a ring fence budget, social care funded through local authorities and heavily means tested. It would be pretty surprising if you had two systems with such different backgrounds working well together, and far too often of course they don't, <coughs> and technological change is also making it increasingly difficult to draw a sharp line between health and social care. What strikes us, well, strikes me very obviously, is that similar needs do not receive equal treatment in the present system today. The obvious example is dementia, where the cost of care is fall almost entirely on individuals and their families, as eligibility for public funding is limited. And our contention is that had the architects of the 48 settlement faced the kind of ageing and illness issues we have today, they would have arrived at different conclusions. And so the stake in the ground that we have put is ambitious. We want to move towards a single ring fence budget for health and social care, in which services are singly commissioned and entitlements for social care are more generous. Of course the implication of this is that we're arguing for social care to be more generously funded from the public purse to share the uh, risk of needing social care across society more as, of course, health care is. It's very curious that you hear people say, well, people should save for their social care needs when they're old, but nobody says you should save for your needs when you're old if you have cancer. Now, I'm pretty well aware that talking about better funding is pretty ambitious in what we've come to think about as the age of austerity. But, of course, it is true that if you're looking <coughs> quite a long way forward, as in a, in a sense this Commission does, there will be economic growth resumes and you get more scope to meet the costs of rising, of rising health and social care. But even with that and with pretty optimistic assumptions for improving productivity in the NHS and modest scope for efficiencies, or perhaps bigger scope for efficiencies, if we can achieve better integration, we think it's pretty unlikely that you could meet these rising expectations and better entitlements without significant changes to, fun to financing. So in our final report, we're, we're really going to try and talk about two big questions. How should entitlement to public support be more closely aligned between health and social care? And how should any new entitlements be funded? We're going to look at options in both cases against some clear criteria, whether or not the proposal for change is equitable, whether it will support, finan whether it will support financial efficiency, whether it's sustainable financially, if it strikes a good balance between collective and individual responsibilities, there's a really big, I think, philosophical question here about what should be done individually and what risks should be shared collectively. But crucially, the outcome will only be a success <coughs> for all of us on the Commission if we end up with a system which responds better to the needs and preferences of individuals and their carers and a system which they can understand and navigate. Now, of course, there are many ways in which you could change entitlements and many ways in which funding could be raised. We've set out a number of options on both. Uh, on the latter, on funding, we've applied the criteria already to say we don't support either a wholesale switch to social insurance or tax relief on private health insurance. But there are a whole load of remaining options, changing taxation for everyone, um, changing the tax burden or reducing the benefits for the elderly, and indeed there are some proposals we've included because we want to make a complete list, some ways of increasing user charges. It's perhaps inevitable that quite a lot of the press today has focused on this and implied that these are things that we have suggested firmly. I should say on behalf of myself and the Commissioners that these are just options. But we paint a picture of health and care that unaltered are heading in an unsustainable direction, both for the public finances and for families at times of need. 
So we're looking forward, really looking forward, to your responses to our views and the financing options. And we're hoping that in the final report, we'll be able to set out a package of changes that adds up to a clear vision for the way ahead. Thank you very much for your attention.